introduction and also to Professor Chisholm for really setting the stage for some of the things that I'm uh, going to be talking to you in the next 15 minutes about. So if you wanted to have a little nap, this is the answer. What makes us gain weight, genes versus the environment? It's really both, but it is pretty complicated. And there's a lot of research going on around the world to try and ascertain the genetic contributors to obesity. And we haven't got the answer yet. We've got a few of the answers. But the problem is that there are many small genetic effects that contribute to us gaining weight. And as Professor, Professor Chisholm mentioned, they also determine, and other genes determine, where we put our body fat. So it's not terribly simple. Just by way of quick background, we know that 50 million Americans are obese. It's predicted that 83% of Australian adult males and 75% of females will be overweight or obese by 2025. One in eight hospital admissions and one in six hospital days can be attributed to diseases related to excess weight. So that's a huge number of patients in our hospitals. Obesity is recognised as a disease by the US Endocrine Society, the WHO, the World Health Organisation, and the uh, American Medical Association, but it is controversial. And the real question is, is obesity a disease or is it associated with and contributes to many other diseases? And these include metabolic disease, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, obstructive sleep apnea, which uh, is directly related and much more common in people who are overweight or obese, cancer. And we know now that there are certain cancers, particularly bowel, breast and esophageal, that are associated with excess weight. And people who carry more weight are more likely to get these cancers. And there are many factors and there's a lot of research going on uh, in the Garvin that are trying to elucidate the factors that might link obesity to cancer risk. Infertility, the polycystic ovary syndrome, but we often forget and we shouldn't forget about the musculoskeletal side effects of excess weight arthritis, aches and pains, etc., and also depression and other mood disorders that are associated with excess weight. So these are all really important contributors. Now, this is the reason why I get up every morning, uh, and that is really to prevent all of the complications that are associated with diabetes. We have a number of diabetes clinics in the Garvin and also uh, in the hospital, and we know that diabetes is associated with retinal problems, so eye disease, one of the, the, the commonest cause of blindness, kidney disease and people requiring dialysis, strokes, uh, liver and heart disease, foot ulcers, as you can see here, and other complications that are listed on this slide. So what causes obesity? This should be simple, but it's not. And this is a summary that tells you a little bit about what might contribute. So as the quote nicely says here, obesity stems from energy imbalance derived from a complex interplay of behavioural, genetic, environmental and social factors. So as you can see here, it's very difficult to untangle all of the contributors that, could, that lead to excess weight in our community. And there's no doubt that if you consume excess calories and you're physically inactive, that you will gain weight. One needs to really find that right balance to try and reverse that, and it's not so easy as Professor Chisholm mentioned. But the thing is that not everybody in our environment where food is plentiful and physical activity is, is often difficult and limited, not everybody is obese in this environment. So what might be driving this difference? Why do some people put on weight and, and others don't? And genes are part of that answer. So this is a classic study that was published in the New England Journal back in 1990 where a very famous obesity researcher, and this is probably before you've had ethics committees, um, took a series of 12 groups of the identical monozygotic twins that Professor Chisholm mentioned. And what they did was they overfed these um, twins by 100 kilocalories for 84 out of 100 days. So basically made them eat 50% extra of what they were consuming at the beginning. And the striking thing is if you look at one twin from the pair and the other twin, there's a very, very similar amount of weight that was gained over that time. Five kilograms for those twins, a little bit more for those, up to 11 or 12 kilograms for these twin pairs. But within each twin pair, apart from a couple, the amount of weight that was gained over this time was very, very similar. But what's striking is there is a huge variation between each of these twin pairs in the amount of weight that was gained. And they did the opposite experiment. They calorie restricted them and they showed the amount of weight that they lost was also very similar within each twin pair, but it varied between each of the twin pairs. So this is one, really one of the earliest studies that suggested that genetics 
does play a major role in determining how much weight we gain and lose and contributes to obesity. But when we talk about genes, it's quite confusing and you can have single gene disorders where there's a single gene that's knocked out, one particular gene. I'll show you a couple of examples shortly of what happens when you knock out a single gene which has a massive effect and leads to excess weight. And there are a few examples of this in biology where you get massive weight gain. But much more common is polygenic disorders and polygenic obesity where there are multiple genes, maybe hundreds, thousands, millions of genes that all have a very small effect that either each contribute to excess weight themselves or they interact with each other or they interact with environmental factors so how much we eat and exercise that contribute to obesity. And this is much more common and therefore you can understand why the research that's been done in this area has been extremely challenging. Because to find all of those small genetic effects is obviously very difficult. So how do genes cause obesity? We've said that they are important but how do they do it? Well they have direct effects on body acu accumulation. And you've already seen the strong genetic influence on how much fat we put around our tummy. Secondly, they interact with environmental factors. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, we know that there is a genetic predisposition to becoming overweight. But modifications in environmental factors can alter the expression of this genetic risk. So, in other words, if we are physically active and we eat in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right way that, that reduces body weight, then that genetic predisposition may be less well expressed. It doesn't come out as much as it would if we were doing the opposite. And if we do the opposite and we consume excess calories and don't exercise as much, that genetic predisposition might be expressed in our environment uh, and therefore that contributes to obesity. So the genetic predisposition is there. That doesn't change, although it might over generations. However, it, it's whether it's expressed or not or how much it's expressed and how much it contributes to excess weight might be partly at least dependent on the environment that we live in. So if we can change from this to this, then we might have a lower risk, even if we've got genes that are predisposed to being overweight in our family, to reduce the manifestation. But genetics also contribute to how much we eat. They contribute to appetite. They contribute to the drive to eat. And there are certain people that have a very strong drive to eat, and that may run in the family, it's genetically determined. But there are others that don't necessarily have a very strong drive to eat. So not only do genes contribute to how much weight we gain, not only do they contribute to how, where we put our body fat, but they might also contribute to our appetite. So this is a, uh, a cartoon of the brain within the hypothalamus, which is a very small area in the brain. And we know that there are a series of hormones which are listed here which are very important in reducing our appetite. And when you stimulate leptin, which Professor Chisholm mentioned, which is produced from fat, that interacts with another receptor and then it leads to this downstream effect which then culminates in a reduction in food intake. So every time we eat food, we stimulate these hormones and they reduce the, uh, the, the, uh, our drive to eat. And it's like a series of dominoes, I suppose, in a way. This is the one we mentioned, leptin. When that falls over, that hits this re receptor, the leptin receptor, which hits another hormone, a protein, which hits another one there. And there's this series, many of probably which we don't know, that need to fall over for us to reduce our food intake. And you can imagine is that if we lack one of these, or we lack a small bit of these, or this is off to the side a little bit, or it's a different size domino, then that message to reduce our food intake may not get through and we may not uh, experience that uh, feeling of uh, feeling full. And one of the major hormones in this area is leptin that's already been mentioned in the previous talk. And when this hormone was discovered, there was great excitement in the medical literature because it was thought that maybe if we don't have this hormone, then you become overweight or obese. And in fact, there were some amazing studies done in animals that illustrated this very fact. So these are two wild type uh, animals and these, this is a, a mouse that actually lacks leptin. And as you can see, when it lacks leptin, it becomes morbidly obese, it doesn't stop eating, and it outweighs more than at least two of its lean <laughs> litter mates. And this is just looking at them from an aerial view. You can see that this animal becomes massively obese compared to what's called the wild type that has normal leptin. So this generated a huge amount of excitement, as I mentioned, and it was thought that maybe the cure for obesity has been discovered. 
But as with many animal experiments, it doesn't necessarily translate into humans, which is, really stresses the importance of that flow from animal to human research and back again in many circumstances. If you look at most overweight or obese humans, that's not the case. So this is a graph showing body mass index measured in kilograms divided, uh, divided by height squared. And the higher the number, the more overweight or obese you're said to be. And this is looking at the leptin level. And rather than showing that people who are overweight or obese have low leptin, the opposite is found. The more overweight or obese you are, the higher the leptin level. So that was great disappointment, disappointment because it was thought that maybe that wouldn't be the case. But we should have expected this because we know that leptin is actually produced in fat. So the more fat you have, the more leptin you make. And uh, this is obviously not the answer to obesity. I worked in a group in the UK about 10 years ago where we studied some of these hormones. And there are a few humans that have the single gene defects that I showed you before, where they lack one of these hormones, one of which is leptin. And you can imagine, if you don't have the hormone here, then none of these other dominoes are going to fall and we're never going to reduce food intake. And in fact, leptin deficiency has been described in about a dozen humans in the world. Leptin receptor deficiency has been described in a few more. Deficiency of this receptor here called MC4R accounts for about 5 to 6% of severe obesity. So they are being described now. But I'll just show you one example of leptin deficiency and how if you lack a hormone and give it back, and this is a genetic cause of obesity, it can actually reverse how much body fat you have. So this was a child, child B called in the paper, who weighed 42 kilograms at the age of three. And this was a child who had leptin deficiency. And as you can see, he has excess fat throughout the whole of his body. And this was identified in a consanguineous uh, marriage, so two relatives who, were, who, were, who, who got married, and it brought out this recessive disorder. And this was a small child from Pakistan. And he had very, very low leptin levels. If you took any other child who's the same weight, who's got, who doesn't have this disorder, their leptin levels would be very high, as I showed you in the previous graph. But this child had very low leptin. And what the group that I worked with did in the UK was actually derive the hormone leptin in an injection and gave this hormone to this child every day for a number of years. And as you can see here, you can almost not recognise this individual. He's lost a lot of weight and by the age of seven years he weighed 32 kilograms. I should just say that this hormone doesn't give you a tan, so don't go out and, all, <laughs> and, and buy it. So obesity stems, as I told you, from energy imbalance derived from a complex interplay, but how, and I've talked about some of the genetic factors. I've talked about the environmental factors. Just a quick note on social factors. And this was a study, some of you may have heard me talk about this before, published in Obesity Research. And what they did in this study was they, like, they looked at the association b between weight and marriage and what happens when you get married and what happens when you separate. And as you can see here, in this, this is the study in the US, is that when these men got married, they gained, a, this is in uh, uh, BMI, but almost one kilogram per metre square in BMI, it's a few kilos. Similarly, women gained the same amount of weight. Interestingly, when women separated, they lost most of that weight, but the men didn't. So if they had multiple marriages, they kept gaining weight. And this is from the paper, this is not my view, but they say marriage increases opportunities for eating, so that might be one of the reasons why. And people who leave a marriage lose weight to increase attractiveness, and those who get married gain weight because of a weakened motivation for keeping weight down. <laughs> this is not my view. <laughs> but Leslie Campbell, who's one of the other expert clinicians in the division, has told me that she knows exactly why this is the case. And I've asked her why married women are more overweight than single women. And she said that single women come home, see what's in the fridge and go to bed. <laughs> with married women come home, see what's in bed and go to the fridge. <laughs> All right, so on that note, I'm going to be hauled off in a minute anyway, I think. Um, I've shown you that genetic factors actually contribute to obesity and excess weight. I've also stressed the importance of excess energy intake and a sedentary lifestyle. But what I've also tried to illustrate is that genes are also interacting with energy intake and sedentary lifestyle or environmental factors on a daily basis. And all of these complex factors actually contribute to obesity. So in summary, in conclusion, I should say, genetic factors interact with environmental factors that cause obesity. Genes have an underappreciated role in influencing food intake and the drive to eat. I think that's really important. And as Professor Fabreo said at the beginning, it's not just that people are lazy and can't stop eating, 
there's a strong genetic drive to food intake. And finally, most importantly, elucidation of the genes that cause obesity is an important prerequisite to the development of novel weight loss therapies. And you'll hear about some of these drugs from Dr. Catherine Tonks in the next talk. Thank you. Thank you.